what is the thrust of the pedagogy that you see being fulfilled through the through map at this moment? There are really two strains of what we're doing. One is under the kind of bracket of map education. And then the other is a called the Map Academy, which I'm running. And the biggest distinction is that one is geared very much towards the collection of map itself and its local audiences. And the Map Academy is more broadly looking at education independent from it being attached to a collection and more hinged on art history itself and where photography kind of fits within that. So in terms of the outreach the museum will do and has been doing is we have workshops which might include photographs and it's not necessarily looking at them in their historical context but looking at how we can then get our audiences to engage with particular images and start to ask broader questions. We work with a very large number of schools in Bangalore from across various kind of, you know, there are government schools, NGOs, private schools. And they, before the pandemic, they would come into our education space and we would run programs for them. Now that that can't happen, we still do that, um, but in the online space. MAP Academy, which is a separate project, is really looking at how do we teach the history not only of photography but of different disciplines that kind of make up an idea of Indian art history and that's obviously a very complicated question um, because it's trying to kind of balance what I see as a certain need to present a kind of canonical version of things because that's mm. for a lot of people that's how you make something accessible that's how you rationalize it and make it understandable which is why it's used as an educational kind of system, but at the same time showing that this is only one narrative. We're writing a huge amount of content as new content um, where there'll be biographies of photographers, um, introductions to various themes and genres and very basic, a very basic level of thing where we're, we're kind of looking at existing scholarship and then we're trying to write that in a much more accessible, easily understandable way for a general audience. And one of the things that I wanted to ask you, which you intimated over here, is the canonization that has occurred in the past through writing. And I suppose the problem with canonization here uh, would be the, the hierarchizing of a certain understanding of art or photography. Or, and of course, one is always trying to you know, tease that away what are your thoughts about that? I mean, uh, popular content and accessibility of popular so content. Do you mean kind of appealing to the popular sensibility or do you mean popular as in what might be called vernacular? So both. On the one hand, are we looking at a scenario in which vernacular material also has to be made readable to the vernacular, to the community from which it arrives from? Uh, I think the answer is you do multiple things. And I think at the museum, what we're going to try and not do is just have two or three blockbuster exhibitions a year on a particular photographer, which definitely does then run the risk of, you know, be they a celebrity photographer or be they a popular or vernacular photographer, it's always going to kind of put them on that pedestal that the traditional museum space yeah. does. I think another actual hopeful thing that will happen out of museums kind of rethinking what they are and rethinking how they reach audiences because of the pandemic will also address that question because this whole idea of the museum as this kind of sacred, important, big space um, is being undone. And I think just to kind of go slight, not too much off topic, but one of the ideas we realized as a museum in thinking of how we tackle the online space is it's very tempting to just replicate the physical space in an online space mm -hmm. and have a virtual exhibition and say, look, we're going to have a 3D plinth of a mm -hmm. chola broth. Mm -hmm. And then you realize why we, it's, it's very much like um, in graphic design, web design following print design. There's no real logic for it. It's just that what people think you have to do. You translate a book and you put it on the screen. 
So in this context, we're thinking why in a virtual exhibition would we put a bronze on a plinth in a white space? It doesn't make any sense. Here's an opportunity for us to recreate a temple digitally, put in the sculpture there, put it with all of the sounds and visuals and things like that, and then actually use the digital space to show something in its real context. So I think that is a really key thing we're going to look at now and, and not just trying to emulate the museum experience online but sort of think how we can improve on that but i also think there's there is a there is an inevitable nature of an institution mm. promoting a certain celebrity culture and i wonder whether that is which is the kind of canonization and that's where you get your hierarchies mm. and i wonder whether an element of because of the way society is structured, that's what people want. I wanted to ask you, I mean, this is a good time to sort of bridge things to your, uh, to your publication itself. Um, a lot of what you're talking about is also in one respect or another associated with how one engages with the global culture. Um, at the same time, uh, what I found interesting and curious and you can enlighten us about it is that your own background seems to have started in European photography um, and so already you had to you had a line of sight um, maybe the line of sight that you had was from the the era of deep modernism can you talk about some of some engagements over there that you found really fascinating these vs Indian photography but your background in you're right. Funnily enough, actually, I mean, my kind of academic, as in when I was at university, education in photography was definitely Euro-American. Mm. But professionally, before I moved to India, the gallery I worked for was mostly interested in Eastern European photography, mm. which in itself was a slightly, um, slightly different from the kind of central mm. Euro-American narrative. But I think that you're right. I, I learned a very traditional Western view of photography. And then, of course, when I moved to India, I was looking at how that fit. And to a large extent, things do fit because as the book kind of points out, a lot of the photographers, especially 20th century photographers in India, were impacted by European um, and American kind of narratives in photography they were very much aware I mean mm -hmm. having either studied there or that was the material that they were interested in and then a further level of complication is that at the beginning there was a certain shared history the historical nature of it being invented in the kind of middle of the colonial period so I think these these things mean that every that it is very much interrelated um mm -hmm. And I think that's what the book was trying to say is that you can't really think of a large part of Indian photography in isolation from what's happened everywhere else. And mm -hmm. that's the version of photography in India that I'm interested in and which I kind of wrote about in the book, which is a product of my own background. Mm -hmm. So I have this sort of interest in, in the history of British India and photography and the current history of contemporary photography in India and I feel like I'm invested sort of emotionally and professionally in both those histories so it's, that's why that kind of is what I look at as a curator and a writer I suppose. One of the things uh, that is uh, clear is that you are interested in photography from India which doesn't need to necessarily include Indian photographers. Mm -hmm. You make that very clear and present uh, in your discussion and also by the selection of the works that are in there. Can you talk about um, the editing of this book uh, and the challenges you came across? Editorial processes are, are inevitable and that's part of the fun of, of any publication, any exhibition. It's part of the exercise that curators and writers kind of engage with. When you're approaching a book like this, I think it's, there's also a certain amount of responsibility of the reader to think that what's the context of this book? Who's written it? When's it being published? Who's it being published by? Where is it being distributed? And, and if you arm yourself with that information, then looking at it critically is part of the process of, of digesting that material. But in terms of our strategy, we decided that we very much wanted these 10 chapters which 
is a way of broadly dividing up different themes and genres in photography, which mm -hmm. are kind of semi-chronological. So colonial sort of um, early photography can only really exist in a particular period. Of mm -hmm. course, the themes and the ideas can expand beyond that, but generally it exists in a particular period. Photojournalism continues today, but it had a kind of golden period okay. where it was really forming itself. So again, we look at that in a particular period of time. Mm. Um, street photography has a particular meaning. Obviously, as you know, you can find very early examples and you can find contemporary examples, but it had a moment at a particular time. So with all of these different categories that we chose, we decided they have a particular moment. And that allowed us to organize them chronologically. Mm -hmm. um, it gets much more difficult with the sort of last three chapters where you're dealing more with the contemporary space, because I feel that without the benefit of hindsight, you don't really know what's important. And I think then it becomes a lot more subjective. The book designer had a huge part to play. In, and it's also nice to, and to have somebody unfamiliar with the subject who could then have a kind of outside opinion about what works well together editorially, what sort of looks interesting. Well, but as uh, media is changing so fast, contemporary practice is incorporating and imbibing different forms of media so fast. How easy is it for scholarship to keep up to speed with practice? Does practice come before pedagogy or does pedagogy come before practice? I think in the context of the book, it had to try and do two things. One is to present the work in a way that people would understand it. And again, we're not just talking about Indian audiences. The whole point was for this to have an international audience to introduce people who are completely under, unfamiliar with the territory with a way in. But then I think incrementally you, you introduce slight shifts in that. So um, we chose categories which are quite understandable, but there are also slight shifts on what the previous way of categorizing things would be. So we might talk about street photography, but then the essay talks about how in the Indian context, the idea of the street and public space means something completely different. Mm -hmm. So it's street photography, but it's not street photography. Mm -hmm. And I think the museum will do a certain a sort of similar thing of you have to, you can't suddenly reinvent things, but you have an incremental move towards perhaps a more representative way of positioning things. I think there are two problems. One, as you point out, mm -hmm. is the whole idea of the ethics of representation and how sensitive that is as a question now that there's really no space for traditional methods of documentary or photojournalism mm -hmm. without it kind of being this big problematic conversation which it should be and that's interesting yeah. but i think that means that that whole genre is very is very difficult and i think that photographers need to find a different way of engaging with issues mm -hmm. and i think on top of that there's the whole just complete oversaturation of of visual images that means that they don't have that meaning anymore you feel like images have lost their power. The traditional idea of the photographic, fine art photographic image has lost its power, is then going to demand a new way for photographers to look at the medium. I have one last question. Uh, we were getting into um, the terrain of, of the vernacular, the subaltern. And after all, the vernacular is, in India is not isolated from the vernacular in, say, Latin America. Uh, mm -hmm. to a great extent, media sort of exerted itself similarly in different places also. And this is my, my point about photography is universalism and its appeal, and then of course, it's a regional impulse yet again. Um, having looked at, again, this trajectory of photography from India in an international space, what for you have been the interesting lines of sight and associations that can be made or can be created so that we don't constantly box it in. See, I think one thing I definitely have noticed, I mean, what I found interesting having lived in India, but then also now living in Singapore in the kind of heart of Southeast Asia, mm -hmm. and not that I'm particularly involved in the scene here, but when I go and look at exhibitions at the National Gallery here, be it of photography yes. or of modern art, the similarities between what happened post-independence in 
modern and contemporary art in India and what happened in Southeast Asia and what continues to happen with artists looking back at their histories of independence, it's incredibly similar. And I think, as you say, this is where things get really interesting because you realize that nowhere is really, no country is completely working in artists. It, 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 there are very few countries that have a completely unique um, response to politics and politics is global. Again, with, with the museum and with MAP, we're trying to, you know, it is a, a museum for Indian art. So there will also be a certain amount of photography from India there. But what I really want to do with the photography department is to think, right, let's not just look at kind of dialogues and similarities between Western narratives. But as you say, what's happening in Latin America, what's happening in South Africa, what's happening in Southeast Asia and kind of finding those similarities. 